Hello everybody, my name is uh, Dr. Yahya Ethawi, I'm a consultant neonatologist in Al Qasim Hospital, uh, part of Ministry of Health and Prevention of UAE, and I was nominated to be the director of neonatal prenatal medicine fellowship program that is related to the Arab world. And this is the first uh, video record of the half academic days for the fellows that will be used for their future uh, future references to review these uh, academic days. Now, the most important part of the uh, resuscitation is having a general principles or key points. The most important key point is anticipation, and anticipation involves the uh, operator, the physicians, or the healthcare providers, the uh, the uh, devices, the setting or the place, and also the what happened to the baby. And the primary goal of neonatal resuscitation must concentrate uh, on the first part, which is adequate airway and respiration, in addition to thermal control. Additional steps might be taken for more sick babies or babies with special circumstances to control the temperature. The, one of the general principles or key points is the presence of a skilled person in basic neonatal resuscitations, whose primary goal or attention to uh, take care of a newborn baby and that person should be present at birth. Uh, and the ideal situation is uh, that each delivery of a high-risk baby should be attended by such person with his, uh, such skills to perform and complete resuscitations. For that person, he needs uh, three areas. He needs to know the uh, physiology of perinatal uh, uh, resuscitation and he has the skills and also in addition to that a good communicator understanding the roles of the other team members involved with him or her in the care and how to communicate with these members such communication will allow uh, the uh, anticipation of the roles of each person and their communications uh, in certain circumstances and situation in a timely, structured, and comprehensive way. To do that, there should be a structured program. An example of that is the NRP that is run by the Academy, American Academy of Pediatrics. However, other programs also can be used. And such a program or such an approach of resuscitation, um, uh, it would be successful and it would have a very high percentage of uh, success of helping the uh, newborn babies at high risk because of the structure ability and the uh, completeness of the uh, resuscitations of uh, various personnel. Now, for the perinatal physiology, the resuscitation effort are designed to deliver uh, and help the transition of respiratory and circulation of a newborn baby. And that's usually accomplished by lung expansion and then the clearance of the fluid from this lung. And now, and, and after the clearance, establishment of effective and the word effective are important here, air exchange. And then uh, termination of right to left shunt in utero to left to right after uh, uh, delivery. That critical period uh, for the physiological changes to happen need uh, somewhere around few to several breaths where the lung expand and the partial pressure of oxygen increases both in the alveoli and then in the arterial circulation. Elevation of 
partial pressure of the artery from fetal intrauterine level of around 25 millimeter mercury to the postnatal level somewhere between 50 to 70 millimeter mercury usually associated with the following so the lung uh, expand the fluid cleared and the uh, effective exchange starts and the uh, pul uh, pulmonary and arterial alveolar and arterial partial pressure increases from 25 to 50 to 70 this increment causes decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance decrease in the right to left shunting through ductus arteriosus increase venous return to the left atrium because of increased the circulation to the uh, lung and uh, lung expansion rise in the left arterial pressure and cessation of right to left shunt through foramen ovale this and in termination of fetal circulations to uh, postnatal neonatal circulation Adequate systemic arterial oxygenation result from well perviewed expanded lung, well ventilated lung, and adequate well uh, perfused, and this is a little bit of mistake here, well perfused uh, ex expanded lung and then adequate circulation. However, the problem starts when there are some conditions that uh, occurs at delivery that compromise such transition from fetal to neonatal circulation. Alter alteration in tissue perfusion and oxygenation ultimately result in depression of cardiac function. However, the human being um, initially uh, responded to such depression uh, 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 resulted from hypoxia by becoming apneic. And apnea is uh, cessations of effective uh, flow in the airways uh, for 20 seconds or maybe sometimes less than 20 seconds when associated with the pradi. So even a relatively uh, brief, uh, um, brief period of oxygen deprivation may result in primary apnea. However, rapid recovery from such state is simple, appropriate stimulation and then exposure to oxygen. However, if that period of hypoxia prolonged, uh, the baby start to have a relatively uh, irregular gasp and then move towards secondary apnea. This can occur uh, at birth, but sometimes a little bit away from the peripartum period. If the baby moved to secondary apnea, now providing stimulation and oxygen is not enough and we need to provide effective assisted ventilation in addition to the oxygen. Now, the problem is that the standard practice says that we should delay cord clamping. So what will happen if we need an additional steps that prevent us from such practice? So majority of infants, no additional steps are needed during beyond providing some dryness, stimulation, warmness, and, and the baby is okay. If the baby starts uh, spontaneously breathing, then it's okay to give him the leisure of having the cord and getting more blood from the placenta before dividing the cord by about 30 to 60 seconds. During that period, the baby uh, can be on the mother chest or abdomen to uh, use the mother's skin for warmth. Also, can be dried and use other measures to warm the baby. The, uh, however, if we need additional step of the resuscitation, you have two options. There is ongoing studies uh, that a resuscitation can be done while the cord is assisted, uh, while, uh, while the cord is still uh, intact. However, uh, resources and logistics need to be present because, before such practice can be implemented. But the, 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 the current is to cut the cord and hand the baby to the neonatal team for uh, support if there is inadequate or absent respiratory effort. 
The goal of the, of the Teresa station are mainly four. First, minimize heat loss by providing dryness, warmth, and when you control the temperature, there will be decreasing in oxygen consumption to control temperature. The other point is to establish airway and effective ventilation by allowing normal respiration and lung expansion. Uh, and that happen we have to clear upper airway and may need to provide positive pressure ventilation once we do that we might need to provide some oxygen or without oxygen the uh, arterial uh, uh, oxygenation will increase after uh, adequate alveolar ventilation however the oxygen provision is not required routinely it might be necessary in some situations and the finally we should support the circulation and cardiac output the key in resuscitation is anticipation and anticipation lead to being prepared so pre pre uh, uh, preparation is the key to success of resuscitation we know that only 10 percent of babies need some help when we say some help we mean some stimulation and maybe provide some oxygen however less than one percent might need extensive resuscitation measures and when here we need to control the temperature uh, control the ventilation and maybe a circulatory support the problem start when there is some perinatal conditions that uh, may lead to uh, prevention of the uh, transition from fetus to neonatal period and that's what we call it high risk deliveries in uh, ideal world the obstetrician should notify the pediatrician before birth if time permit and then the, the pediatrician will review the obstetric history and assessment and eventually leading to conclusion is that high risk delivery need to be attended and then uh, the preparation uh, in general and for specific problem related to that delivery if we can we can discuss the general and specific problem of the delivery with the parent there are some evidence and that's not the time to discuss these but there are some evidence that uh, non-reassuring fetal uh, status can be uh, assessed from obstetric history for example category 3 uh, fetal tracing that uh, can present either in a sinusoidal pattern or absence of variability and these are associated with uh, late deceleration recurrent variable decelerations and bradycardia other evidence of non-reassuring fetal status is history of acute events such as apraxia placenta or cord chloraps or abnormal fetal testing done by the obstetrician or the skull ph is less than uh, 7.21 other and reassuring is history of decreased fetal movement uh, problem with the growth of the fetus abnormality of uh, umbilical vessels such as uh, absence or reverse diastolic flow other anticipation is presence of fetal diseases or potentially serious conditions that might allow or prevent the normal physiological transitions uh, this can be antepartum, intrapa, and intrapartum events. Example, uh, the lica is stained with meconium, or baby less than 37 uh, completed weeks, or gestation, or, or a prematurity, or baby can be postmature after 42 weeks, or baby have low birth weight, or the baby have high birth weight, or there is major malformations, or there is hydrox, and also uh, uh, multiple gestation other conditions so we talked about uh, non-reassuring fetus and then we've talked about fetal conditions but also uh, the labor and delivery conditions might contribute to prevent the normal transition such as vaginal bleeding of the mother or abnormal fetal pre 
representation that delay or prevent normal delivery or prolong or unusual labor from other reasons or maybe a presence of shoulder dystocia that prevent uh, extracting the baby from uterus. However, there are other conditions. They might not need uh, the presence of pediatric team, but definitely they need to be assessed and triaged before admission to an ICU, such as unexpected congenital anomaly or RTS, anticipated uh, um, un 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 unobserved neonatal depression, for example, baby born without risk of the APGAR score is less than five at, at uh, less than six at five minutes. Or there might be maternal condition might contribute to prevention transition, such as maternal fever, or membrane is ruptured more than 24 hours, or abnormal smelling of the amniotic fluid, or there is a history of sexually transmitted disease of the mother. And there might be also diabetes or RH incompatibility, or mom has hypertension, chronic or during pregnancy. She might have renal, endocrine, pulmonary, or cardiac diseases. She might be on alcohols or other uh, substances that might cause symptom or might cause withdrawal. Other conditions that do not need presence but might contribute to uh, abnormal transition needed assessment and triage is uh, the type of the delivery. However, absence of any antenatal risk factor Delivery by C-section of a term baby does not increase the likelihood of uh, prevention, the transition, and usually uh, they might not need attendance of uh, uh, a resuscitation team. Now, what is the necessary equipment? Uh, these, uh, the most important is they should be ready and present before delivery, and each delivery room should be equipped with the following. Radiant warmer with uh, procedures uh, uh, table or bed, and the warmer should be turned on and checked before delivery. And for low birth weight and premature babies, additional warming techniques might be needed, such as uh, pre warming the delivery room to above than uh, 25 degrees Celsius, or using plastic crops to cover the baby or using exothermic mattresses. When, uh, if you used uh, unnecessarily a combination of these techniques, uh, just remember not to cause hypothermia. Other equipment is blended oxygen source. There should be, we should never use direct oxygen flow. Should, we should get, get a flow uh, somewhere between eight to 12 liter per minute and blended with oxygen and this oxygen can be controlled from 21 to 100 percent the uh, oxygen should be humidified and should be observed by pulse oximetry to prevent hypo and hyperoxia flow inflation bag or self inflation bag with adjustable pop-up valve or safety valve uh, is important. If we use self-inflated, then a reservoir is important to increase the oxygen delivery. The size should be appropriate, which is about 750 ml, and should be capable of providing 100% oxygenation. Uh, for better fitness, we should have a proper size face mask. Also, we should have bulb syringe for suctioning and stethoscope to uh, assess the baby and preferably should be appropriate size.